Uh, good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, my name is Bernard Christophe, and I'm your moderator this morning. I'm a labor trustee for a Canadian Commercial Workers Industry Pension Plan. I also sit on, as a member of the board of the Canadian Board and participate in the planning committee for this uh, conference and other conferences in uh, Canada. And as Mary Jo uh, indicated, uh, this morning we'll be streaming this session online to remote audiences. This is a new and exciting addition to the International Foundation programs that allows for individuals from all over the country to experience a portion of the 2010 Canadian Annual Conference. I would like to welcome, of course, you all for joining us today, and particularly those on the website. The session today, Leadership Above and Beyond the Crowd. And we are fortunate today uh, to have as our speaker uh, someone who has experience in that particular area. Uh, for the past two decades, he has analyzed people's inaction, centering his uh, research on innovation, productivity, leadership, and motivation. He has shared his message with thousands of people worldwide, made presentation to a Fortune 500 company uh, throughout the world, as well as appearing on national radio and television talk show. And he told me that it is the 14th time that he appears at the International Foundation Annual in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, indeed, he appeared on public television and uh, in an eight-part series on his work titled Reaching New Heights of Excellence. In addition to being an author of several best-selling books, and he tells me he authors some 13 of them, he has a rich and varied background as a news reporter, newspaper columnist, college instructor, and professional pilots. He holds a PhD in management. I should also tell you that Dr. Melton will be talking about books, will be available for book signing to be held at the information services booth near our registration desk on the fourth floor uh, following uh, this particular session. And the title of his book is identical to the title of this session today. So he is one of the handful of modern day philosophers who travel the globe a transforming complex issue into simple common sense terms for many of the top Fortune 500 companies, as I say. Today you will discover how successful people can become even more successful. Please join me to welcome Dr. James Melton. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> Good morning. And bienvenue aux participants de la province de Quebec. And the live stream video as well. Uh, welcome to you folks as well. Beautiful place in San Diego. Je voudrais faire un petit sondage, si vous le permettez. How many people would like to have just a little more fun in life, just out of curiosity? About half of you, okay. <laughs> I thought there'd be more than that, Mary Jo. <laughs> How many would like to have a little more money in their lives? Anybody at all? Oh, well, that was easy. I got the other half. That's good. How many would like to have a little more love in their lives? Just a little bit more. Guy's got two hands up over there. <laughs> a lot of people say they want more love, they want more enthusiasm, they want more of what the, quote, good life has to offer. And yet, for some reason or other, a lot of people are not willing to make the mental and physical changes necessary to bring about the changes. Now that's what Webster in his best-selling book, The Dictionary, calls stupid. See, you can't even have change without being willing to make the shift. And the shift I'm talking about is from wanting to having, from thinking about to doing, from dreaming to experiencing. It's, it's simple. Il n'y a pas beaucoup de différence entre vouloir et avoir, penser et agir, rêver et réaliser. Un petit changement, ça suffit. You don't have to go that much further. 
be number one, just a little bit of a shift. The title of the book is Leadership Above and Beyond the Crowd. And when I put this together, I called some people to talk with them personally about their thoughts on leadership as well. I've got this one a little earmarked for today. But in here are comments from people on leadership, such as Alan Bean, the astronaut, fourth man on the moon, Howard Bihar, the retired president of Starbucks International, Scott Kastner from JetBlue, Nancy Kirchner from the Walt Disney Company, and Howard Putnam, former CEO of Southwest Airlines, along with a few other people in there. And I was privileged to have them include their comments in this. And what I've done today is I've synthesized some of these ideas. And everything that I will be speaking about today is basically in your handout. So it's an abbreviated version, of course. So let me begin, if I might, by saying that I, I kind of like to think that leadership in itself, a person who actually demonstrates leadership, possesses what I call emotional wisdom. And emotional wisdom relates itself in a way that people respond and interact with other people. We're going to talk about five points of leadership right now. And I think one of the points that I want to begin with is the ability to accept people as they are, not as one would like them to be. And in a way, this is probably what I would call the height of emotional wisdom, the height of being able to get in someone's eyes and look out through life as they look at it. Now, this is obviously not possible, but if we as leaders can put ourselves in the other individual's shoes, it makes it a lot easier for us to get a feel for who they are. We don't condemn, we don't judge, we don't criticize, we don't demean. And what I like to think is if something that someone is saying really disturbs you, it's probably a good time to take a look at yourself. Because very often other people will reflect or we see that reflection of what is really in us. Robert Frost put it this way. He said, we love the ones we love for who they are, not for what we want them to be, not for what we think they could be, not for what we know they should be, but for who they are. And the opposite is, if only you were more like me, then I'd love you so much more. <laughs> and that's not what leaders do. It's little thinking. And when I talk about little thinking, I think, Little thinking creates little people, and great thinking creates great people. Number two, the capacity to approach relationships and problems in terms of the present rather than the past. <clears throat> Certainly we can learn from the past and our past mistakes, but to continually rehash them is almost futile. I think it's better to use the present as a springboard, as a starting point, if you will, to moving forward and resolving a lot of what's going on in life. Will Rogers put it this way. He said, don't bring too much of yesterday into today. Did you get up this morning revitalized, refreshed, and in tune with life? Is that what you do? Or do you get up at the crack of noon if they let you? I mean, how do we approach the day? I know some people who get up in the morning and they say, good morning, God. Other people get up and say, good God, it's morning. <laughs> How do you greet the day? Do you greet each, each day as a new day? Or do you get up and live the same day over again 365 times? We all live in a sand timer. And all the sand in the top of the glass is the future. It hasn't happened yet. And all the sand in the bottom of the glass is the past. You can't even get five seconds of it back. We actually live in this stream of motion, this ocean of motion, in the center of the sands timer. 
Everything in the universe, in your universe, is happening to you right now. Mark Twain put it this way. He said, I'm an old man and I've had many problems, most of which have never happened. Consider one point. Change your thinking and change your life. Point number three. The ability to treat those who are close to you with the same courteous attention that you would extend to strangers and casual acquaintances. Now, Dana, my wife and I lived in Denver for about 11 years. And where is Dana? Is she here? Dana, stand up. Where are you? There you are. Give her a hand. <laughs> She's the woman who makes my life the spectacular adventure that it is. We were in Denver for 11 years, and we were living in the Cherry Creek area. And I was out there for my morning jog. And this guy was coming toward me. He was huge, Bernie. He was about 6'6", must have weighed at least 300 pounds, maroon t-shirt on, and was barreling down the street at about 200 miles an hour. Well, I was moving along at a pretty good clip myself, and we were on a collision course. So I figured, well, one of us better step aside. So I did. <laughs> he was big, I'll tell you. And we got about as, as close as we are right here. A little closer, actually. And I could see the whites of his eyes. So I looked at him, and I smiled, and I said, good morning. And his eyes turned away from me. He picked up his pace double time. He sped on by me. I could feel the breeze as he walked on by. And I said to myself, that's sad. We all live on the same planet. We all eat the same foods, we have the same goals, the same needs, the same aspirations, and yet for some reason or other we can't look one another in the eyes and smile. Well, the very next day, on the very same street, very same time, the guy had the same t-shirt on, he was about a block away, but I knew it was him because I was downwind. I mean, there was, there was no missing this guy. And we got about the same distance away, and I said to myself, as every single person in this room has at one time or another, I said, okay, Jim, now's the time to take a risk. So he got close enough to me and I said to myself, do it. I smiled and I said, good morning. And he stopped, dead in his tracks. Scared the heck out of me. He towered over me, he pointed directly at me, and he said, do I know you? I said, yes, we met yesterday. <laughs> it's happened to all of us. We're in the restaurant, 15 minutes goes by, and we still don't have our water or our menu. And we get a little ticked off, we say, hey, come on over here. I'm a busy person. I've got places to go, things to do, people to see. Can't you hurry it up just a little bit for me? Or you're in the bank on a Friday afternoon or outside of the bank in the line. The line's so long you can't get in there because the teller's having trouble making money or something. Finally, you get in there and you get up there and you, you, get, you have a little few words with the teller and say, come on, hurry it up. I'm important. I've got things to do here. I can't stand around waiting for you to get this put together. And the very next day, this person with whom you were a little bit short with, a little bit curt with, possibly bordering on abusive, walks into your church, walks into your place of business, walks into your travel agency. And the very first person they see there is you. <laughs> How pleased they're going to be. How long do you think they're going to want to stick around? Just like that, they're going to want to be out of there. What I'm sharing with you today, ladies and gentlemen, you don't need. You came to the program. Put your hand high over your head. Put it up there. Now reach over and pat someone on the back. You deserve to be congratulated. You came to the program today. What I'm sharing with you is this. We need to learn to extend the same courtesies to perfect strangers as we would to those we love. But some people in this room and on this webcast have to do the exact opposite. 
to learn to extend the same courtesies to those they love as they would to perfect strangers. And only you know who I'm talking to. This leadership skill is needed mostly, and it's most evident often, with our families. Trait number four, the ability to trust others even if the risk seems great. Withholding trust, in my mind, is often too high a price to pay. It means constantly being concerned about whether someone's going to do it right or wrong. I would rather risk disappointment and deception maybe even than to take it for granted that everyone is incompetent. And here's an example of how people teach others how trustworthy they are. Trust and ethics have, a, have an interaction and it's sometimes misconstrued to a degree, but trust and ethics it's about a, a, a man and his son who go to the, the bank and the father's going to cash the check. And he says, son, wait here, I'm going to cash this check. He walks into the bank and the little guy watches him walk in, walk up to the teller, and the teller gives him the money. And he counts it. And he, the father walks close to the door and he stops before he gets to the door and he counts the money again. And he gets outside, and the little guy says, what's wrong, Dad? He says, son, we have a problem. The teller has given me $100 more than she should have. We have a real ethical dilemma. Should we or should we not tell your mother? You see, in leadership, to get power, you give power. To get trust, you give trust. We're teaching people all the time what kind of a person we are. And finally, number five, and then we'll get into the techniques. The ability to do without constant approval and recognition from others. Particularly in a work situation, this can be devastating and it can even be counterproductive. Leadership by its very nature is risky and you're never going to pull out full, full approval. It just doesn't happen. How do you get to know what kind of a person other people are? Do you really have to know them? Probably not. But you can tell a lot about people. In a moment, I'm going to talk about lifting our senses to another level of leadership. But let, let's just take an example. If I had someone here on the stage, and he was in a casket, and he was dead. You, you never met this guy before. You have no idea what kind of a guy he was. Or you're at the funeral. You don't know this person, but you're at the funeral. It's like the Herald and Maud where they go to funerals. Remember that movie? How would you get to know what kind of a person he was? This is called audience response. <laughs> How would you get to know? what? Right, 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 get to know their friends, right? The people who came to the funeral. By the, by the way, the number of people who will attend your funeral will largely be determined by the weather. So... <laughs> You want to schedule that date very, very carefully. Corporate executives don't hang out with bums. Students on the honor roll don't hang out with school dropouts. Top producers don't hang out with coffee clutchers. We tend to draw into our circle of friends those people who think like we do. I'm pleased as all get out when I draw into my circle of friends those people who think, because most people don't. Ken McFarland, the late great American educator, said if most people said what they were thinking, they'd be speechless. <laughs> the emotionally wise leader realizes that the quality of work will suffer when undue emphasis is placed on being the good guy. Okay, let's get to the crux of the matter. What can we do to move into or enhance our leadership position. 
Well, the very first thing we can do, and these are short, is communicate clearly. And of course, this too is on your handout. So, the old statement, I know you believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what, what you heard is not at all what I meant. If people would just say, what do you mean? These four words would go a long way to clear up a myriad of misunderstandings. Words like boss, manager, male, female, even less controversial terms like do a good job, do it quickly. What's a good job for one person is not necessarily a good job for someone else. So we're talking about interpretation. Words are only expressions of how we feel. Dennis says, I'll be with you in a jiffy. How long's a jiffy? I mean, I've learned how long a jiffy is. <laughs> I say to her, I'll be back in a little bit. Could be a day. I mean, we're talking about interpretation. Lee Iacocca, in his uh, work, he talks about this. Let me just find this little page here on Lee Iacocca. Here it is. If I had to sum up the word, in one word, the qualities that make a good leader or manager, I'd say it all comes down to being decisive. I think that's important. Be decisive. As a matter of fact, and you can take issue with me on this if you want to, I feel it's more important to be decisive than it is to be right. Now this is a breach of logic which has existed for leaders throughout history. You know people who are good decision makers who are not necessarily good leaders, but I'll bet you any money you do not know a good leader who is not a good decision maker. I would like to um, demonstrate this if I might, and I need um, I need a volunteer. Thank you. Would you mind coming up here? This uh, the, 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 would come come on up here. No, no, this this lovely lady smiling right there. This lovely lady. I'm gonna this lovely. I know she thought she was gonna get away with it because this kind gentleman rose to the occasion. <laughs> but this let's give her a hand. Come on up here. What's your name, honey? Liz. Liz. Okay, come on up. This is Liz. How many know Liz? <laughs> okay. <laughs> How many would like to know Liz? Okay, come on over here. Come on over here. All right. Now, I'm not going to put you on the spot at all. I'm, all right, I'm, right. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I can tell. <laughs> I see the tears welling up in your eyes. All right. That's okay, Liz. Okay. Uh, I'm only going to ask you one question, but I'm going to talk just a little bit first. I'm going to demonstrate what I call the SIP principle. Now, let's say you received a telephone call from your very best friend. You've known this person all of your life. You've gone to school with this person. You've shared lunch with this person. You've worked with them. And they called you up and they said, gosh, Liz, I've been thinking about you for the last couple of days and I felt compelled to call you. I don't want to borrow any money. I don't want to ask any favors. I just want to let you know that you are a very important person in my life. And you motivate me to do my very best. And I know you always do your very best. You are a compliment to your job. You're an asset to your community. I'm getting to like her already. <laughs> I don't want to take a lot of your time because I know you're a busy person, but I just want to let you know one thing. Whenever I w I'm with you, I really feel good about myself, and I'm so pleased I can call you my friend. How would you feel? <laughs> Whatever you want. <laughs> Let's give her a hand. Oh, by the way. I'm oh, are you serious? Yeah. Thank you. I want you to have that. Thank you very much. Please enjoy that. Thank you. It's a great book. I read it myself. Really? <laughs> Let's give her another hand. If you were a doctor and you just received that telephone call, you suppose you'd be a better doctor? Sure you would. If you received that telephone call as a teacher, would you go back into the classroom and probably be a little more patient with those little kids? You probably would. In light of the previous conversation, what more would you know about being a doctor, a teacher, 
an accountant, a trustee? Probably nothing. Probably absolutely nothing. You see, the SIP principle is just that. It's a principle. It's like other principles. I'll explain what it is in a moment. But the principle of the gravity works simply. When I step off the top of the building, I go down, not up. When I jump out of an airplane and I pull the ripcord and the chute doesn't open, that's the packer's problem and he has one. When I misuse the law, I lose. And whenever I try to get without giving, I lose. The SIP principle is simple. S-I-P. Self-image equals performance. Whenever you raise the opinion you have of yourself, you raise the level of your performance. Whenever you lower the opinion you have of yourself, you lower the level of your performance. How many people here know anyone in their lives who ever, has ever failed kindergarten? <laughs> Did you really? Really? I went to 36th Street Elementary School in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Mrs. Werfel was my kindergarten teacher. Neat gal, but she was a little rigid. And we were all sitting, and she had a bun on the back of her hair, you know. It, we're all sitting around this wooden table making these paper boxes with this huge jar of white paste that you love to eat. Remember that stuff? You know, it's kind of white and tastes a little fine. I was putting more in my tongue than I was on my paper box. And Mrs. Werfel came over and she picked up one of the children's boxes at my desk and she said, Children! Children! This is not the way to make a paper box. And she threw it on the table. And the poor kid was devastated. His face was red as a beet. You could see the tears welling up in his eyes. And as she was holding my box high in the air, <laughs> yeah, it was my box all right, I felt like I was out of step with the rest of the class. And I didn't spend but two weeks in school after that. I got mumps, whooping cough, measles, bronchitis, strep throat, anything, so I didn't have to go back to school. And I watched all the kids walk on to first grade. And I had to take that paper box over again. I took special reading classes all during elementary school because I was taught that I was a slow reader. I took special reading classes all during high school because I was taught that I was a slow reader. And I bought into it hook, line, and sinker. My 12th grade English teacher told me, and it was very uncomfortable for me when she told me because Polly Jens was standing there by the blackboard with Jack Kusky and Wally Henderson. I'll remember it to this day. And I had a crush on Polly. Never asked her out. Never asked her out. And Mrs. Ingram, she said to me, she said, Jim, don't ever attempt college. You'll never make it. I learned two things from that example. One was never to allow anyone to tell you what you can have. And number two, whenever you are self-assured, you never attract an adverse opinion. Whenever you feel right inside, you don't pull out garbage from other people. And whenever you know who you are, you don't create static in the world around you. Do you know why? Because it's a law, and there's not that much allowance for ignorance. We've got to know what we have inside, and we've got to know how to get it out. There are many ways to reach an end. Some are actually better than others. So we're actually talking about trust. Trust is not gained overnight, but it can be lost in an instant. And how, in fact, we communicate that to people is very important. And another element we talk about in leadership is motivation. Motivation increases as people are made to feel part of the team. I did not feel part of the team, and I wasn't motivated to move ahead. So that's very important as well. All right, let's move on to the second point here. Listen to the feelings behind what you hear the other person saying. Listening is important. It's a very special ingredient. Listen to the feelings, not to the words. I call it being a concerned listener. In my book, I talk about this quite extensively. 
And it says, if you truly desire to excel, being 100% present is essential. I've lost all of you five times since I've been talking, 50 times, 150 times, whatever. You've been home. You've been thinking about the talk last night. You've been wondering what's going to happen at the break, what's going to happen this evening, where are you going to dinner. Am I right? It happens. I'm not asking you to rivet your mind on what I'm saying, but I will say this. When you as a leader are speaking to someone, be there. Be there and be 100% present. Can you tell when you have someone's attention? Yes, you can. Can you tell when you don't? Yes, you can. Do you think it works the other way around? Of course it does. We need to realize that. Listening is a key ingredient. I was in Las Vegas and I was getting ready to fly back home to Palm Springs and there was this guy sitting next to me and a very fine stately looking woman sitting next to, to him. And he was talking and talking and talking and she was very patiently listening. And he kept talking and talking and talking. And she asked, she said three magic words. She said, tell me more. And he did. He kept talking and talking and talking. And at the end of eight minutes, I lost track of the word I he used after 58. And she had only used the word I twice. Fascinating. Then he got up and he went to talk to the flight attendant before he got on the plane. And he said, I just met the most interesting conversationalist. Never realizing he was doing all of the talking. It was uh, Cabot Robert who put it this way. He said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. When someone asks you what you do for a living, what do they want you to ask them? What you do for a living. When people ask you, do you have any children? What are they burning inside to share with you? To talk about their children. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. All right. The third ingredient here. Observe with your senses. We only see with our eyes, but we observe with our senses. This is the height of leadership, I believe, when you can sense other people. Remember what I talked about earlier, the ability to sense other people and pay attention to your feelings along the way. And we are all rather predictable. So if you learn to read people effectively, you can read the innermost feelings that they have. Now just for a moment, if you will, take a pen or a pencil out and use the margin or the back of the paper or whatever. And I want you to write down, this is very important that you do this now. I want you to write down four words. Find a pen, find a, whatever it is. Just write down four words. I'll tell you what, the, what, what to do in here in a second. Okay, are, are you ready? Ready? I want you to write these words down without thinking. I just want you to do it just really fast. You're not going to deliberate. There's no thinking permitted here. Are you ready? I want you to write down a color. I'd like you to write down a number. I'd like you to write down a piece of furniture and write down a flower. A color, a number, a piece of furniture, and a flower. Now, if you're still writing, you're thinking, and that's not permissible. But I'd like you to look up at the screen, if you will, please. How many have one or more of those items on their paper? Raise your hand. Look around you, please. How many have two or more? Interesting. Almost half the room. How many have three or more? How many have all four? Fascinating. Okay. All right. I can tell you this. If it's not red, it's probably a primary color. If it's not seven, it's probably a single digit figure. If it's not chair, it's probably a sofa, a couch, 
a, cha a, a table or some common piece of furniture, and I can bet you a donut to a rye crisp, it is not a yellow double blueing hibiscus. <laughs> what we're talking about is predictability. And it says to me, and it ought to say to you, that I know a lot more about you than you think I do. And it ought to say to you that you as leaders need to know a lot more about the other individual than they think you do. Not to get one up on them, but to just be aware. All right. Our second to last point. Speak confidently and decisively. Very important. Say what you want, not what you don't want. Focus on the solution, not on the problem. I always say, when you enter into a group, if you are a leader and the group comments are spiraling down, you either need to lift it or leave it. If you're not creative enough to lift the conversation, then you need to spark up your leadership skills a little bit. And get gossip out of your vocabulary. Get it out of your style. It's hard to get things straight firsthand, let alone listen to second and third hand garbled rumors. That's not on the leader's agenda. We're going to talk about, in this next area on speaking, about word magic. Words are only feelings. You've heard me say that before, word magic. I've created an entire sheet in your handout on word magic. You don't have to look at it now, but I'd like you to look at it later on. Nous utilisons des mots pour communiquer, mais souvent ils sont insuffisants. Words are very often insufficient for what we want to say. I'll give you an example here. An article from the York, Nebraska Police Department on how people try to explain their automobile accidents in 30 words or less. The guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. <laughs> was he aiming? <laughs> the phone pole was approaching fast. I was attempting to swerve out of its path when it struck my front end. <laughs> I pulled away from the side of the road, glanced at my mother-in-law, and headed over the embankment. <laughs> the, the pedestrian had no idea which way to go, so I ran over him. <laughs> Was there a choice? I'm not sure. I was on my way to the doctor with rear end trouble when my universal joint gave way, causing me to have an accident. <laughs> not at all what these people wanted to say, but it is what was recorded in the listeners' minds. Now, I want to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, what messages are being recorded in your listeners' minds when you walk through their doors? What are you saying to these people? All right, let me take a quick look here on body language. In my book, I talk about when you feel confident about yourself, it will be expressed in everything about you in the outer world. I think it was Walt Disney who put it this way. He said, when you know the magic, you will always have a place in the kingdom. And what I'm about to share with you will form the fabric of your future. It's very simple. When you change the things you say about the things you do, you will change your experience. When you change the things you say about those with whom you associate, you will change your relationships. Dana and I were in Portland, Oregon a while back. And this is a little scenario that, that taught me to say yes to life. 
I've learned that you can always say no. Say yes. Always, you can always say no. We were getting the grand tour of Portland, Oregon. Are you familiar with Portland, Oregon? Anybody at all? Anybody? Okay. It's a city of bridges, a lot of bridges in Portland. And we were, we were going over the bridge, under the bridge, over the bridge, under the bridge. It was a, it a three-hour tour of Portland. We were on the off-ramp, off the on-ramp, on the off-ramp. Off, I, mean, I mean, the woman was trying to take us over the bridge going the other way, but it was a one-way bridge. She couldn't do it. We were on, off, on, off. Finally, we got in the downtown area at 9th and Yam Hill, and the Guild Theater was there, and the day the earth stood still was playing. Classic 1951 science fiction film with Michael Rennie, Patricia Neal, and Gort. How many have seen The Day the Earth Stood Still? Classic film. I said to Dan, Il faut que tu vois ce film. It's a classic. You've got to see the film. So we got back to the hotel. We were staying at Lloyd Center at the Red Lion Inn. And I called the theater up and said, What time does the movie start? They said it starts at 6 15. Well, it was quarter to six. I said, we've got time. I called the bellman up downstairs. I said, can you have a cab here in five minutes? He said, sure, no problem. Got downstairs at 10 minutes to 6. There was no cab. Five minutes to 6, no cab. 6 o'clock, no cab. Five after 6, I was getting a little concerned because the flying saucer lands in the beginning of the movie. You've got to be there at the beginning. It sets the whole tone. Well, just then, this Bentley automobile pulled up chocolate brown in color. It was gorgeous. The chauffeur got out of the vehicle. He walked around and he opened the door for these two lovely couples. The women were literally dripping in elegant white garments and they strolled on into the hotel like this. <laughs> you know how they walked. Anyway, I said to Dana, there's our cab. <laughs> and the bellman ran up to me, he grabbed my arm, he said, wait a minute, sir, that's not your cab. He said, your cab is yellow. And I said to myself, why can't that be our cab? Why can't we go downtown in the Bentley? Why does everyone always try to tell us what we can't have in life? So I went outside and I talked to the driver. And I said, pardon me, sir, his name was Mike, just so, just so you know. Remember Mike, Dana? Neatest guy. He's kind of standing there, leaning up against his high fender, tapping his cheek. Anyway, I said, would you happen to be going anywhere near the Guild Theater? There's this neat science fiction film. Starts in about five minutes. We've just got to see the beginning. And he thought, just for a second, snap decision. That's what I like his decisiveness. He said, sure, get in. So we got in the car. We drove away. He stopped right in front of the box office at the Guild Theater. There were 10 people in line. I counted them. He turned around. He said, we're here. I said, I know. He said, well, aren't you going to get out? You're going to miss your movie. I said, well, aren't you going to open our door for us? <laughs> <laughs> he laughed. He said, OK, I'll play your silly game. <laughs> So he got out of the car, he walked around, opened the door, and this lovely couple <laughs> emerged. <laughs> we got in line, we got our tickets, we saw the movie. When the movie was over, we walked outside of the theater, and there was the Bentley. He said, your car, sir. <laughs> now, I did tip him a little bit before, I have to say that. <laughs> anyway, he, he picked us up, he drove us to uh, McCormick and Schmick a seafood restaurant on First and Oak. We had a lovely seafood dinner. Picked us up from the restaurant, drove us back to the hotel. The bellman was still standing there, shaking his head. He walked away like this. <laughs> you see, what I didn't know, and what the bellman did not know, because he was new on the job, and what none of you know is that anyone could have had a ride in the Bentley. All they had to do was ask. It was a courtesy car for McCormick and Schmick restaurant. You see, folks, this is a mouth. And if you want anything to happen in life at all, you've got to be willing to open it up just a little bit. <laughs> Say yes to life. Say yes to leadership. It is extremely important. All right, finally, if I may. I'm going to talk about character very quickly. My friend Cabot Robert, 
said character is the ability to follow through on a good resolution long after the mood in which you made it has left you. And you teach your character so often. And there is no right way to do a wrong thing. You notice how this is interwoven throughout the talk. Trust, character, ethics, very important. Whatever we do, we need to express it with a little bit of enthusiasm. Why not? Be a little enthusiastic. We only get one chance at this, folks. It was Walt Disney again. I like Disney's work. He said, success is finding something that you love to do so much that you would do it for nothing. And then you learn to do it so well that people will pay you well to do it. And as I said, we only get one chance at this. This is it. Every choice you've made up until now has brought you to the leadership position you are in. In order for anything else to occur in our lives, we have to be willing to make different choices. I'm going to tie this together with a little poem. I love this poem. It's called The Blinking Flapper. You know what a flapper is? back in the 20s or 30s, kind of like a glamour girl or movie star. It's about a flapper who lived in the Riverside Drive apartments overlooking the Hudson. I have to set the scene a little bit. It goes like this. It was midnight on the Hudson. The whole of the fleet was there. And high in the drive apartments, a flapper was in despair. She couldn't go out. Her mother had locked her in her room, and so she stared at the ships below her with eyes that were full of gloom. The flash of a blinking signal from battleships dark and grim brought thoughts of a sailor sweetheart. She had learned the Morris code from him. So she picked up her father's flashlight and sent out an SOS, and a lonely gob on a signal bridge blinked back. Are you in distress? I'm a poor little locked-in flapper, the girl with a flashlight winked. Me too, said the lonely sailor, as he blinked, he blinked, blinked, blinked. In every port you've a sweetheart, said the flapper who now got flipped, and you girls flashed the gob back quickly, have sweethearts on every ship. They spoke like this for an hour, of hurricanes, love, and gin, of seasickness, fudge, spumoni, and automobiles of tin. May I come around to see you? Tomorrow's my day on shore. I live on the drive, she answered, 984. Good night, sailor boy, she signaled. Good night, went the sailor's light. And every ship and the fleet flashed back. We'll be there, little girl. Good night. <laughs> it says to me that some people are looking for one thing and other people are looking for something else. But I want to guarantee you something. Before you walk out of those portals today, what you are looking for is looking for you. All we need to do is open up our eyes and find the very best path of accomplishment we can to achieve our dreams and desires. Enjoy the process of leadership. Enjoy moving from the present to the future and enjoy your traveling to leadership above and beyond the crowd. I thank you for your kind attention and je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Thank you, Dr. Melton, for your great presentation. And thank you all of you for being here and those who viewed this presentation on remote. Again, I want to remind you that Dr. Melton will be signing uh, his book on the fourth floor.